Notifications. Notifications. Messages. Email. No, please. Storage, for instance, or just anything where you need the storability, where electrons are harder to store, hydrogen is going to be easier. That also leads to a downside, though, because hydrogen is less energy dense than the usual things that we use for storable energy today, like coal or oil or natural gas. So you will need more volume of storage to handle the same amount of energy. Let's talk about the viability as well and how it may differ in different geographies. What is your view on that? Yeah. So for green hydrogen, again, from renewable electricity, really places with the best renewable resources, things like Latin America or the Middle East, uh, even Southern Europe have really, really good potential for producing hydrogen. And then when you're looking at uh, blue hydrogen, which is produced from natural gas or coal with carbon capture and storage, we do see that becoming more expensive than green hydrogen in the future, uh, especially as renewable electricity costs come down. But that can be a viable option in places like the US Gulf Coast or Russia, where you've got good geological storage for the carbon, uh, as well as ample natural gas that's quite cheap. All right, great breakdown. Thank you so much to our Meredith Annex, our Bloomberg NEF hydrogen specialist. And of course, you can get more from the Bloomberg NEF team on the terminal and online. And they've recently done a podcast called Hydrogen 101 as part of its Switched On series. So from iron ore titans pivoting to cleaner energy to talk of a hydrogen revolution, that's it from this week's edition of Bloomberg Green. We'll be back next week with a deep dive into the state of electric vehicles. And you can keep the conversation going by following us on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Climate. I'm Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet as we await the latest FOMC Minutes Focus on the Fed, brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. It is a down day on Wall Street. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ, they are all declining right now. We have got the S&P 500 index down 32 points, a drop right now of 7 tenths of 1%. Dow Jones Industrial Average down 269 points, a drop right now of 7 tenths of 1%. And the NASDAQ Composite Index down 144 points, down 1%. Also, the 10-year yield right now 2.05%. Spot gold up 7 tenths of 1%, 1866 the ounce, while West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil up by 1.9%, 9387 a barrel for WTI. Federal Reserve is releasing minutes of the January 25th 
uh, January 26th FOMC meeting. We will pass along those details to you as they become available. Right now, we, as I mentioned, we've got the 10-year yield 2.05%. The S&P 500 index down 22 points, a drop right now of 5 tenths of 1%, while the Dow Jones Industrial Average is lower by 212, a drop of 6 tenths of 1%. A headline from the Bloomberg Professional Service, Millennium and Point72 have discussed bids for Quant Fund Engineers Gate. Right now, the tenures I mentioned, 2.05%. Among the economic reports uh, out today, retail sales did rebound in January on across-the-board gains, even as the COVID-19 Omicron variant raged. Online retailers, furniture stores, and auto dealers led last month's sales increase, the largest advance since 2021. Again, recapping S&P down six tenths. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio, streaming on YouTube, it is a Fed Wednesday, February 16, 2022. Carol Master along with Tim Stenovec. And we are breaking down those minutes, FOMC minutes, from the first Fed meeting of 2022. We are seeing some equity reaction. Uh, and we are seeing equities move off their lows. To start off, an important mention of timing for the balance sheet runoff. The median survey projection for the commencement of balance sheet runoff shifting into the third quarter of this year, roughly a year and a half sooner than in the December survey. So much of this, Tim, is going to be, is the Fed more hawkish in its tone or is it more dovish? Yeah, we're seeing some more headlines here as we continue to go through them. Fed participants saying significant balance sheet cut likely appropriate. And to be fair, uh, as we see kind of a little bit of a spike, I'm going to tell you that equities, for the most part, are pretty much unchanged in terms of those headlines. And just looking at the yield curve, uh, we're seeing that tenure maybe come in a hair, um, but uh, not, I don't think, a ton of reaction uh, overall. All right, let's get to it. Uh, we got a lot coming up, including a deep dive with Carl Icahn. You will not want to miss this 30-minute conversation. We've also got a Bloomberg exclusive on Morgan Stanley and some earnings, Tim. Yeah, we have, uh, after the bell, uh, we have earnings from many companies, including Fisker Automotive that I'm covering. Carol, and we're going to bring those to you live. Uh, also, growth flatlined in supermarkets last year. Plant-based substitutes, they are appearing in new places. Ravioli? Yeah, I'm, I'm in, I think, I guess, as long as you take out the salt. All right, let's get to it, and let's get to the Market Drivers Report. Let's get to it and the Business Week agenda on this Fed Wednesday. Kathleen Hayes, Global Economics and Policy Editor, Bloomberg News, been reading through the Fed release uh, in an interactive broker studio, along with Kriti Gupta, Markets Correspondent at Bloomberg News, or at Bloomberg. Um, Kathleen, take it away. Well, I think what's most important here is what they're saying about the balance sheet. We, it was soon appropriate to be uh, to start raising rates. That we knew. Uh, balance sheet plans to be determined in upcoming meetings. But the fact that the participants... It's hedging it a little bit, though. We didn't get an exact date there. Because they don't know what it is, but they say significant balance sheet cut likely appropriate. I don't. I, to me, I've got to get read through my minutes more. I started reading through them where there's uh, they're seeing strong growth, they're seeing upside risk to inflation as we would expect. But uh, they, now that we've got something coming up, that they, they agreed the timing, the pace of the balance sheet runoff would be determined. They generally noted that current economic and financial conditions would likely warrant a faster pace of balance sheet runoff th than what they did in 27 to 2019. Okay, that's very. Very, very important. They're not going to waste any time. They're realizing they've got to get the balance sheet runoff done. They've got to stop. They've got to get to the point where uh, there are no bonds that they're purchasing. They get flat and maybe even start. It's also a lot up. more on the balance sheet this time around. Nine trillion. Yeah. So, but it's an important move because they have said they're going to keep the the Fed funds rate as their primary tool, but. The balance sheet now is going to be important, too, as well. Remember the, uh, in the uh, interview with the Wall Street Journal published just Wednesday, uh, excuse me, Monday, Esther George from the Kansas Fed City Fed said that, you know, it's complicated, but we used QE to add stimulus when we were on the way down. Now we are removing stimulus, and this is going to be another important tool. I think as we get more uh, more headlines coming out, as Pretty our Fed clear. team in Washington yep. starts keeps pouring them out on well, the Bloomberg terminal, we're going to get see what the discussion was. Let's hey, get to markets. Right? Yeah, Kriti Gupta, come on in here, because you've been watching the market reaction here, uh, starting with uh, yields. What are you seeing and also equities? 
Yeah, well, you had that knee-jerk reaction that Carol talked about, right? You did have stocks uh, hitting, I think, what looks like session highs very, very briefly, and then coming right back down uh, to earth. And the same, a similar story for yields, especially on the front end of the curve, not a ton of moves. Um, there, the 10-year yield, I mean, we're still flat. We were flat before this report came out, and now we're just flat by a little bit less. Um, what's interesting to me, and Kathleen really hit on this, is the importance of the balance sheet, because this isn't just about tapering anymore. This is about actually selling um, or actually we not reinvesting. We know the Fed's going to raise Rates. Right. And we also already knew uh, that the tapering was happening at twice mm -hmm. the pace that happened last time. So we already knew that they were going to speed it up. The question was, were they going to do it at the same time as uh, these kind of rate hikes or just wait for that first rate hike and then start to sell or, or not reinvest essentially? Or was it going to be in the back half of the year? Now, Chairman Powell did say it was going to be in the back half of the year. He did make that comment. He did not specifically say it would be in the third quarter. So that's no, but, new. Uh, but I think it's also important to realize that running, letting the balance sheet run off is passive. Yeah. That's when you just don't replace maturing securities. Right. When you actually start selling what's there, that's yeah. a much more aggressive step. Why is it so important now? Because we have seen yield curve flattening. Now, are people flattening the curve because they think we're going to have a recession? Maybe some people are. It's just a lot. But this is a distorted curve now. And the short term, the, the short end has risen so much because there, we know there's going to be lots of Fed rate hikes now. The long end has not risen as much. The Fed does not want to see a flat curve. It does not want to see an inverting yeah. curve. If you actually start selling longer term, term securities at some point out be, you know starting with the fives moving on out right. that's what would help you stabilize the yield curve yeah and i think that's the kind of thing esther george again president of kansas city fed was alluding to i suspect uh at the presser after the fed meeting in three weeks there's going to be a lot of questions and jay powell may reveal more about it then fomc saw a faster tightening pace if inflation doesn't move down uh, many participants saw a chance of selling mbs in the future mm -hmm. looks like also we'll have to wait for future meetings to get more details about the mechanics of that balance sheet reductions i mean safe to say that jay powell has been very slow in terms of giving out specifics right like there's broad terms that are put out i felt like the last time around we got more in terms of right a, a rate move specifically in right. March, but everything else has been and But, but they did, put, they did um, come out with their list of the broad principles for running down the balance sheet. So maybe the, the step Parameters, now in basically. three weeks is, is what they're going to do is talk. Maybe, maybe I, I would expect there's going to be quite a debate. You know, Jim Bullard wants to speed up. He wants maybe a 50 basis point rate hike. Mm. He wants to get a lot of the... What voice really load. matters, though? Probably. We all talk about this, like, right? Because all the Fed speakers weigh in. What voice really matters well, ultimately? I think Jim Bullard... See, I, I think Jim Bullard... I've watched him for many years now. He tends to be kind of a thought leader. I, I don't think the rest of the FOMC is quite where Jim is yet, but uh, this whole this whole argument about give it a bang and then wait. Then you can pause at the middle of the year and see how aggressive you need to be then. I think everybody counting on, you know, five, six, seven rate hikes should listen to that part too. That it, it, And especially if they can then add a little more oomph from the balance sheet reduction, that would help give that a little turbocharge. Dollar index going down a little bit. Dollar following. index going down. Can I just point out one interesting Please. headline here? Uh, a couple of officials wanted to end asset buying before March. Uh, to me, that's interesting. And, and I think Kathleen 100% nailed important. it. You're absolutely right. Yeah, Kathleen 100% nailed it in saying that we still don't know if it's actively selling bonds on the open market or if it's just not reinvesting it. And, and could, that's going to be the essentially straw that breaks the camel. Just letting it run off or doing active I selling. I wonder if we could guess that Jim Bullard was one of the people who wanted to stop, you know, and just, just yeah. get it done. Just don't buy anymore. Just yeah. be completely done right now. I wonder if Chris Waller, who's former director of research, right. now a board of governor. Yes? No, we got to run. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Hayes, Pretty Gupta, thank you so much. Let's get world and national news. Nancy Lyons standing by in D.C. Hey, Nance. Is seeing its evidence that Russia is adding even more troops near the border with Ukraine. That's despite Russia saying it's sending some forces back to their bases following drills, including in Crimea. Greg Vallier with AGF Investments tells Bloomberg it is a tense situation, but he still does not see Russia moving troops across the border. Putin may be content to come up with an exit strategy, He's still using cyber warfare against the Ukrainians, still stirring up trouble at the border, but not with a full-fledged invasion. Greg Vallier at AGF. President Biden will be speaking with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz later today ahead of an emergency summit of European leaders, which is set for tomorrow. The Biden administration has a plan to tack another $30 billion onto the government funding bill to help fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is Democrats who are now pushing back. Bloomberg's Amy Morris has details from Washington. 
Lawmakers want to get the $1.5 trillion funding package done by March 11th. Department of Health and Human Services officials made an informal pitch to lawmakers. And while the top Republican on the Health Appropriations Subcommittee, Senator Roy Blunt, says he can support the supplemental, Senate Appropriations Chairman Democrat Patrick Leahy says he's not interested in dealing with the request as part of the omnibus spending package. He'd rather move it as a separate bill. In Washington, I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. This is Bloomberg. All right, Nancy Lyons, thank you so much. Carol Master, Tim Stanovic here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Um, dun, da, 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 David Sullivan speaks. And, well, <laughs> the people at Goldman Sachs better listen because he's saying an in-person office culture would remain an important part of the bank's in identity as workers continue to return with the easing of COVID-19 restrictions, Carol. This, this is so funny. You and I are going to be part of a Bloomberg event. It's called Work Shifting, and we've been doing this throughout the pandemic. Uh, and it's really looking at how we work yeah. changes. And it was changing before the pandemic, but accelerated by the pandemic. And there is this debate going on. And whenever I sit down with the CEO, I'm like, get real with me. Like, are you going to be working for, is, is things change indefinitely? Chuck Robbins of Cisco, they're going to report after the closing bell. I spoke with him in January. He's like, we were doing it pre-pandemic. And one of the things that shocked him was how innovative they could still be in lockdown. And he's like, this is here to stay. Okay, not if they you're Goldman Sachs, though. They also benefit from it, and I should put it. Exactly. Hey, you know, it makes me Sorry, think of what Airbnb. I got Airbnb, off on a tangent. That's fine. It makes me think of Airbnb's <laughs> earnings that we heard. And we heard from the company and from Brian Chesky last night, the CEO, who, by the way, is right now traveling around, living in different Airbnbs. And the company is saying, hey, we had X number of people, over 100,000, actually stay for longer than three months. That's one of my favorite parts. Uh, that, like recent stories and what they had to say about people saying, well, if I can work from anywhere, I'll go to the Caribbean. I'll go up to does the that, does, does this stick, though? Does this stick or, it, do, well, or do, we, do we grow out of it, right? If you could be anywhere, would you have done it? I don't know. It's hard to say because we have a young kid okay. and he needs to be in school. And, Do we and put not him doing in? this. Like this is much better by being in a studio. Oh, exactly. Like if I were doing something different, I don't know if I can say that. I think it would make sense if I were single or if it was just me and my wife. But when you have a family and you, you know, when you want your kid in school somewhere and you want some stability, it's not as easy to just pick up and, and, and go somewhere for a few months. And I think if it really does stick, it's going to be a rethink in how we live in our homes. Yeah. And I know people who are building homes, buying homes, they're like, well, I need an office and my spouse needs a, an office. Like, you're going to think hot tub. Got to have a hot tub if you're Gold building a house. <laughs> Goldman says, don't worry about the hot tub. Just be at work. <laughs> All right. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week on Bloomberg Radio.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellipadal. The S&P Nasdaq do remain lower stocks of paired losses as traders assess the minutes of the latest Federal Reserve policy meeting with geopolitical tensions still weighing on markets. S&P cut its decline by about half while the dollar fell. Treasury yields fluctuated. Ten-year yield right now 2.03%. We've got gold up nine-tenths, 18.70 the ounce. West Texas intermediate crude up 1.6%, 93.51 a barrel. Equity market Markets lower. The Dow, the S&P, Nasdaq all declining right now with the S&P down 16, down by four tenths of one percent. The Dow's down 160, down five tenths. Nasdaq down 112, a drop of eight tenths of one percent. Fed officials did conclude at their January meeting that inflation was running too high as the economy closed in on full employment, warranting a hike in the benchmark interest rate soon. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Got it, Charlie. Thank you so much. Just want to bring you one COVID headline. White House Chief Medical Advisor Anthony Fauci saying at a briefing earlier that the dynamics of the COVID-19 outbreak in the U.S. are pointing sharply downward. That's a trend line we'd like to see. Yeah, we're not seeing it just out here in New York City, but throughout the United States as well. Let's get into it with Michael Dowling, president and CEO at Northwell Health. He joins us on the phone from Long Island. Uh, Michael, it's great to have you back with us. Uh, you run New York's largest health system. Uh, give us an idea of how things are looking inside Northwell Health right now. Oh, things are looking very, very well indeed. Uh, I, we are definitely on the exit ramp of uh, of. COVID and uh, consistent with what Dr. Fauci indicated, we only have about 500 COVID patients in our facilities today, and it is dropping each day. So we're in a good place. Um, we're moving back to normality, um, and uh, which is, I think, uh, what we've all got to start beginning to do now, uh, even though COVID will always be hanging around for quite a while. But uh, the degree of severity is much, much less, and things, things are looking very, very positive indeed. You know, Michael, we know it wasn't easy, and I'm sure I can't even imagine the stresses as you guys went through it. Um, and we just kind of looking in and hearing uh, what was going on in healthcare systems like your own. My understanding is you kind of threw the budget out the window. How do you do that? Because you do have to ultimately think about the top and bottom line. I know there was government assistance in some cases, but how do you do that? Or do you have no choice? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a standard thing with us because we've had this situation with Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irene. And ever so often, bad things happen to you, and you've got to be able to react. And especially when the community is in danger, uh, either from a hurricane or bad or, or a thing like COVID, you can't be going around each and every day worrying about the budget because it, you, will, you will not be innovative, you will not be creative, and you will not respond to what is needed to be responded to. So my message was... Do what is right. Do everything we possibly can to, to help people, save people, protect people's lives, and we'll figure out the budget and the mechanics of it later. Because uh, otherwise, uh, you're, you're going to be constraining your, your activities. So during the height of COVID at the beginning in 2020, our, our revenue dropped all, all well over a billion and a half. Wow. And it was scary moments, but we know that you're going to, we, were, we knew that we had the attitude, we're going to win against this virus. Uh, the virus is not going to beat us. We're going to win, and then we have to come back and rebuild. And this is what you do in a crisis. Where are you, Michael, in terms of rebuilding now? How do you, how do you get back, back that lost time, revenue? And I believe we will come out of this year, we will come out positive from a financial point of view at the end of this year. So fully now, recovered financially? the federal help, I was just mentioned, the federal assistant helped, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we started to, uh, to, to, to kind of pivot to bringing back regular business, you know, a couple of months after the height of the COVID crisis in, in uh, the, the spring of 20. You know, one thing I, I'm curious, and we were all talking on our planning call this morning uh, about the business of running a healthcare system. And I was having a conversation with a doctor earlier in the week about just how slim the margins can be in terms of a hospital running efficiently and as it's supposed to, to all of a sudden the system being maxed and strained. How tight is it? It's very, very tight. Remember, we are a $15.3 billion entity. And we're not just hospitals, as you know very well. We right. have huge ambulatory outpatient and home care and all of that, plus academics and research. But we run at about a, a, a one to one and a half percent margin. It's tight. 
So you've got to be very efficient. You've got to be quite productive. You've got to be very, very careful of how you operated. But you've got to move forward each and every day with a great sense of optimism um, uh, and, and still do, do everything you possibly can to make sure we serve the community the best of our ability. It's not hard to make a margin. Mm. If you decide, for example, to sit back and eliminate those services that you lose money on, uh, of the, the, those things that you do that you, you get no money at all for, uh, then you can come back and say, oh, we're doing great, we have a huge margin. But that's not, in my view, that's not why we're here. Mm. We're here to do well, and we're here to do good. And um, uh, we, we're, if we have a margin strong enough to be able to, you know, feed our balance sheet, commit to the investments we need to make in technology, in people, and in infrastructure, and then show a... Uh, uh, yeah, one to one and a half, maybe up to two percent at the end. Uh, we're 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 doing well. Um, now not as well. We're in New York. It's a much more expensive place to be. We right. have unionized staff, which is more expensive. Uh, so you will see places around the country that are much higher margins. Mm-hmm. I'm not worried about them. I worry about what we do, well, and I think uh, we focused on mission, and uh, as well as making sure we try to we make a margin. Uh, to sustain our ongoing business. Well, Michael, and that's why we're that's why we're here. What are the permanent shifts that you see in your business on the other side of COVID? What are the permanent changes you have made at Northwell Health? Well, um, let me. It, it, it accelerates a lot of what we were doing. Okay, not not a complete shift, but an acceleration. So, for example, COVID demonstrated the unbelievable uh, benefit of having large, large ambulatory outpatient entities because they they actually treated an awful lot of COVID. If you didn't have those, you'd be in trouble. Trouble. Um, it accelerated the use of home care. Mm-hmm. It dramatically accelerated the use of technology. So we will never again be exactly the same. And COVID to me was a phenomenal learning experience. Right. And a catalyst for change. Well, it's one of the, in many ways, I would say it's one of the best things that has ever happened. Now, mm. that's difficult to say because of all of the, you know, the... But we the learned a lot. The hurt. We learned, a lot. we learned a lot. Well, Michael, just, just got about 20 yeah. seconds. If there's one thing yeah. that has changed dramatically and for the better, uh, what is it because of what we learned during the pandemic? And just quickly, if you could. That they, uh, it proved to us that we can be remarkably agile mm-hmm. and, uh, and flexible. And if we can continue to maintain that culture of innovation, creativity, and be able to change quickly and, right. and build it into our culture, Right. And there is nothing that we can win in the future. Well, good luck in the future, and thanks for finding time once again. Michael Daly, President and CEO at Northwell Health, author of the book Leading Through a Pandemic. He was named to Modern Healthcare's Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in Healthcare, ranked number three overall. This is Bloomberg.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. <laughs> Block trades, you into it? Uh... Well, are regulators into it? I think that's the bigger question. Well, they've been into it for a few years, yeah, and they, they got a little assist from Morgan Stanley kind of ish, right? Yeah, and we are approaching a year uh, from when the Archegos uh, blow up happened. I was looking back at uh, Viacom CBS stock yesterday. Yeah. You can see that reflected in the year chart. It's amazing, right? Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to talk about this. It's among the most read, and it's a Bloomberg exclusive. In the meantime, we're going to talk about the uh, equity turnaround, Charlie Pellet. Indeed. Uh, let's begin right there. S&P up by nine right now. Reversing earlier losses have been down 41, down nine-tenths of one percent. But right now, green on the screen, we've got the Dow little change. NASDAQ down 10, dropped there of less than one-tenth of one percent. But as Carol said, turnaround, that is the key takeaway here. Up right nine points right now now up by two-tenths of one percent. So the S&P 500 index erasing losses following the release of those Fed minutes. And with the story, here's Bloomberg's Vinnie Del Judice. The minutes reinforce signals that higher interest rates are in the bag and the Fed could start tightening soon, perhaps at a faster pace than the last tightening cycle in 2015, perhaps the next meeting in mid-March, with inflation running at the fastest pace in four decades. The Fed cut its benchmark interest rate to near zero to avert a financial crisis when COVID-19 team struck two years ago. Vinny Dell, Judice Bloomberg Radio. And right now we do have the 10-year yield, 2.04%. Moments ago, the Dow turned positive, swinging between gains and losses. Right now, I'm looking at a three-point gain in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. NASDAQ, as I mentioned, lower by six, down now by less than one-tenth of one percent. S&P, best level of the day now, up by just about 10 points, up two-tenths. 10-year yield, worth repeating, 2.04%. Spot gold up nine-tenths of one percent. 1869, the ounce West Texas intermediate crude up 1.7%. 93 68 a barrel. Workers at an Amazon.com facility on Staten Island will be voting on whether to unionize as according to labor organizers. They say the election will be held in person from March 25th to March 30th. Amazon shares right now up by 1%. Among the names reporting after the bell today, Cisco Systems and NVIDIA. I'm Charlie Pellet, Fed Wednesday. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Woohoo! Did you get the hat? I wish I had. You know, we ought to do that. Bloomberg Radio hats. Give them out to our listeners. Branded Wonderful merchandise. Come exactly. On. Yep. Come on, everybody. Love the idea. All right, Charlie. Thanks so much. Well, among our most read on the Bloomberg today, it's a Bloomberg exclusive, and it's about Morgan Stanley's role in reinvigorating a federal probe examining irregularities in uh, a very lucrative market for Wall Street. We're talking about block trades. Yeah, Shreena Rajan is finance reporter for Bloomberg News. He's with, the, with us in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Uh, let's get some definitions, Shree, uh, just out of the way here first. What, what is a block trade? Large chunks of stock that you need to sell, and it has to be privately negotiated. You can't just dribble them out because if you do that over a long time, it'll take a while. You'll have adverse price action. You might as well figure out a right price at which you can sell off, usually at a discount to where the stock is trading. Say you own a big chunk of Apple and it's trading at 100. You negotiate a deal and it's usually at a discount. So you probably sell it to the best bidder at 95 or 98, and then they hope to parcel it off to other people. So I remember years ago where we would, uh, Laszlo Borini was really into block trades and money flow, and we would track the big moves by institutional investors when they sold the block and watch the money flows, because it was usually an indication of where a stock was going. Uh, we've gotten away from that big time, like through the tech, the tech um, crisis and run-up, if you will. What is it that's at stake, or what is it that investigators have been looking at when it comes to block trades? Effectively, if some people have been blurring the lines and going from the gray to the black, what they're really trying to figure out is when banks get mandates for some of these block trades, are they tipping their friends in the hedge fund world? Are they front-running some of that information so that they can pre-position themselves, possibly by shorting the stock? Because you know when a block trade hits the tape, the stock is going to trade down because a large amount of the stock is coming down the mm -hmm. pike and that will drive the price down. So if you're short the stock, you're bound to make money. So is there some wheeling and dealing going on where some of their clients are shorting the stock so that when the block actually comes through, the bank can tap on their shoulders and get them to buy that? So both sides are happy. Mm -hmm. Clients are in a way beholden to the bank and the clients are making some money. That is obviously not good. Remember that a lot of this operates in the gray area. It is murky. When you're bringing a block trade, what is the hypothetical conversation you're having? 
is it really a legal conference conversation or even a confidential conversation if you don't have the mandate yet these are some of the things we imagine that regulators prosecutors will have to wrestle with and it won't be easy to solve and that might be one reason that might be giving faith and belief to a lot of the defendants that and when i say defendants i'm just talking about the people who they've sought information from right now because they haven't even charged anyone but that's the kind of thing that they would have to solve for and figure out if they have a real case here well take us back about a year ago to arkagas and the blow up there and how this current version of an inquiry into block trades uh was really set off by that i'll take you further back then because this tr- investigation into block trades really started off around 2018 as early as 2018 is our understanding but since then it waxed and waned a little bit and never really seemed to gather steam then what happened last year arkegos bill huang's famed family office that had the surprise spectacular run up and even even more shocking collapse the unwind happened because a lot of the banks worried about the positions that arkegos held moved quickly to dump their holdings and that meant large blocks on across a variety of names hit the market so when investigators a few months down the line started investigating what happened with arkegos you know we know that there are inquiries looking into whether there was market manipulation whether banks were colluding in the sale process along the way they also started looking at some of these block trades and that seems to have breathed new life into this probe that has looked at this lucrative block trade activity and from there it seems to have expanded to other trades that morgan stanley the bank we're looking at that seems to be the center of all this uh is they're looking at the trades that they bought to market and whether there is more wrongdoing and some executives at the firm are under the gun right now and i think that's what caught our attention it's like okay so where's morgan stanley in all of this so they're being investigated too or are there's no charge like where what is it how do we need to look at this firm they certainly seem central to whatever process is going on right now there seems to be a lot of information gathering from the sdny the sec and other people uh, a lot of the threads based on our reporting so far tie back to Morgan Stanley back in November we had reported that their head of syndicate equity syndicate desk uh, Pawan Passi was put on leave it wasn't quite mm-hmm. clear why but now it's become much more apparent that it was tied to this entire block trading probe and now they're looking at some of his clients some of the conversations he's had some of his colleagues uh, so it's going to be interesting few weeks and months ahead as they try and figure out whether they can build a real case I mean ultimately we could get regulators to rule right on this but you said it's murky regulators prosecutors if 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 we if they have what we think they have in terms of evidence in terms of being tracking them for a while it really it, it's really hard for anyone on the outside to be able to definitively tell you which way this goes because I can guarantee you there's someone at the SDNY sitting in an evidence room looking at a pile of stuff who very well could know all the answers. Well, and just got about 20 seconds or 15 seconds. I mean, block trades, it's a part of how Wall Street works, right? It's a part of how Wall Street works. It was made famous by the legendary Gus Levy 50 years ago and still a very lucrative part of the market. Well, incredible reporting. And we said a Bloomberg exclusive and a most right. Sri Natarajan, thank you so much. Finance reporter at Bloomberg News. Well, let's get to Washington, D.C. for an update on world and national news. For that, we turn to Nancy Lyons. Hey, Nancy. Thanks, Tim. NATO defense ministers are meeting in Brussels as Russia continues its buildup of troops along Ukraine's borders. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg calls it the biggest security crisis in Europe in decades. Russia maintains a massive invasion force ready to attack with high-end capabilities from Crimea to Belarus. Stoltenberg says the situation in Ukraine shows the security risk that Europe now faces. The FAA has reportedly referred dozens of new cases of bad behavior in the air to the Justice Department. 43 new cases of violent unruly behavior in the air are being sent over to the Justice Department for potential criminal prosecution. That's according to CNN. This week Bloomberg News reported the nation's largest airlines have been in talks for months with the Biden administration on a national no-fly list of problem passengers. The FAA has opened investigations on more than 1000 reports of airline violence in the past year, most of them related to mask mandates. In Washington, I'm Nathan Hager, Bloomberg Radio. The Omicron variant of the 
coronavirus seems to be waning, and that has the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, saying things are moving in the right direction. But she says it is still too soon to relax mask guidance. Government investigators say former U.S. Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, who served in the Trump administration, misused his position to advance a Montana development project and say he lied to an agency ethics official about his involvement. He's now running for Congress in Montana. His campaign calls the report a political hit job. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Oh, we are living in interesting times. We certainly are. Um, remember a few weeks ago, mm. the Melania Trump NFT? Yeah. Okay, we talked a little bit about it. Right. Uh, well, Mr. Laney Gafapulu has a story out that's getting a lot of traction online right now and on the Bloomberg Terminal. The, the money that won this NFT, so the winning bid for it, it actually came from a wallet associated with Melania Trump. Dun, dun, dun. So basically, the people who created it, bid on it, got it? That's what I'm seeing. Uh, it's really interesting. So a series of blockchain transactions. Remember, we know it's supposed to be a secretive world, but remember that you could really track this stuff. Yeah, I think that's a big misconception that a lot of people right? have when it comes to crypto. If you're not like in the crypto world, and that's why a lot of people argue, okay, wait a second, this type of currency is not actually that good for criminals to use because it can be tracked. Look what happened last week with the uh, crocodile of Wall Street, as they're calling her. Exactly. They figured it out. Okay, so here's what happened. A series of blockchain transactions show that the cryptocurrency used to purchase Melania Trump's non-fungible token came from a wallet, as Tim mentioned, that belongs to the entity that originally listed the project for sale. The former first lady began that action, uh, auction excuse me, in January for a collection of NFTs on the Solana blockchain with art from her first official state visit back in 2018. What did it go for? 1800 Sol, uh, so Solana, worth now about $185,000. Trump listed the winner of the auction on her website along with the bid history that shows that the NFT sold for about 185 grand. The collection is titled Head of State. It was one of many planned auctions Trump said she would release at, quote, regular intervals when she announced the launch of her NFT venture back in December. Now, to be fair, in a statement, the office of Melania Trump said, quote, the nature of blockchain protocol is entirely transparent. Accordingly, the public can view each transaction on the blockchain. The transaction was facilitated on behalf of a third-party buyer. So... Don't you ever think about your grandparents like, what are they talking about? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel like that, <laughs> right? Like, what? So, so what does that mean? I don't know. Potentially that is somebody it, came in it, and said, okay, we want to buy this, but we don't have the it, crypto to do it. So can you do it and we'll pay you cash? Is it like if you're auctioning off something, you want to make sure it sells, you've got like a plant in the audience and you just say, please make sure you buy it? I don't know. Okay. I think the plot, the plot thickens. Dun, dun, dun. NFTs, a mystery right here on Bloomberg.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pelopadal, the S&P NASDAQ, all trading lower right now. S&P little changed on the minus side, down two points, has been fluctuating down less than one-tenth of one percent. We've got the Dow down 95, down three-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ down 48, a drop there of three-tenths of one percent. Stocks fluctuating as the latest Fed policy meeting minutes were seen as slightly more dovish than what traders were expecting. Again, the S&P right now little change. Ten-year yield, two 0.05%. Spot gold up 7 tenths of 1%, 1867 the ounce. And West Texas intermediate crude now down, uh, now up 1.5%, up $1.41 a barrel, 93.48 on WTI. After the bell, we will be hearing from Cisco, down now by 3 tenths of 1%. Also reporting today, NVIDIA down by 1%. We heard from Viacom CVS last night, shares plunging 19.2%. Also reporting last night, Airbnb up uh, now by 4.7%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Oh, t- we're, <laughs> we're talking the dynamics of a household. Uh, all right. After surging more than 50% in 2020, sales of plant-based meats in the meat departments of grocery stores increased only just a smidgen, 1% last year, Tim. Yeah, it's remarkable to, to read that in Dina Shanker's latest article in the upcoming double issue of Bloomberg Business Week magazine. She's consumer reporter for Bloomberg News. She joins us now on the phone from New York City. Also with us is Joel Weber, editor at Bloomberg Business this week. He's with us in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Joel, I think back to where we were about two years ago. I was going to the grocery store every two or three weeks, okay, because that's where I was in, in pandemic mode, using two shopping carts, okay, and I was at the grocery store. I think it was a Wegmans, and there was like this whole section of Beyond Meat that was on sale there, and Beyond Meat stock at, actually at the time was doing pretty well. Yeah, and you know, I think um, uh, y- you haven't gone to the grocery store since. I'm guessing. No, I, I have gone to the grocery store. So, you know what? Taking one for the team during the pandemic. We, we do a lot of delivery these days. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, grocery delivery. The, so, the enthusiasm among investors and and certain consumers was incredibly high um, for uh, you know this the the faux meat, fake meat stuff um, when it came to market. And we've seen it um, reflected in, uh, I'm looking at Beyond's uh, share price, uh, which has come down pretty substantially since that moment that you were at Wegmans all those months ago (laughs) in the before times. Um, But as Dina writes in this latest issue, which I found this to be really interesting, the companies are starting to tack and think of themselves maybe not as always being the main event into something more like an ingredient. So, So Dina, walk us through the strategy and how it's playing out. Hi, thanks. So basically uh, what you have is these companies are no longer getting all the attention from consumers, from people uh, like me in the media, although I do give them a lot of attention. Um, (laughs) People are are getting a little bored with the novelty of a burger made from something other than meat or a sausage made from something other than pork. They're also getting, maybe you guys can relate, getting a little tired of cooking all the time. So uh, the sales have dropped precipitously. Um, Oh, and then there's also the fact that they can get meat a lot more easily than they did during that time when you were taking those two supermarket uh, (laughs) carts through the aisles. So all of these things are making it so that uh, people just aren't feeling as compelled to try these uh, not so new products anymore. So what are these companies doing? They're saying, but wait, there's more. Okay, we can put our fake beef into ravioli. We can put sausage on a pizza. We can uh, put it in a dumpling. So many ways to eat this stuff. And a lot of it doesn't even involve cooking or at least, you know, real cooking. You can throw this into a microwave. You can just put it in the oven for 10 minutes and it'll be ready uh, before your next Zoom meeting. So it's really simple. And uh, hopefully, you know, with all of this uh, melted cheese on top or pasta around it or whatever, whatever else um, is dressing it up, you might not even notice that it's not the real thing. So I have a theory, Dina, and and I'm interested if your reporting bear this out or just a observation from the, the Weber household, which is when I've cooked with uh, fake meat, it doesn't smell good when it's just by itself. <laughs> is that, did that come up? 
you know, it did not come up with any of the companies. Okay. Maybe but I did it something wrong. Definitely. <laughs> it is, no, no, I was going to say it, it's come up with real human beings that I talk to um, all the time. I, I, I've i noticed it in my house. Other um, When I say real human beings, I'm using that term really loosely because I'm realizing I'm, I'm mostly talking about other reporters. Um, <laughs> but people, uh, people have definitely mentioned it to me that uh, there's a funny smell. I, and I notice it too. Um, but I, so they, it it me made me that. wonder actually, like, you know, this is actually maybe a brilliant technique because there's so many things that meat gets added to. And, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be meat. It could be fake meat. And, like this solves the other problem of maybe not having that... You know, the smell of Joel cooking in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming over, Joel. Oh, my. I don't know that I am. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Follow Joel. that question up, Carol. <laughs> so, Dina, my problem with this plant-based uh, food is that I don't know that it's definitely healthier. And I guess that's what I'm thinking about, that that's where food is ultimately moving in terms of direction. Does that hold it back from growth as well? Definitely. I mean, it is... You know, as a as a category, um, there's nothing. Nobody's going to say this category is a health food category. You can go product by product, and some will have you know a better nutritional value than uh, others. But um, and and that's also becoming some a way that the newer companies are uh, trying to differentiate themselves is by saying, look, we're only using. Um, a handful of ingredients or um, we have uh, fewer calories or whatever it is. But compared to, uh, you know, like the real stuff, I mean, it's kind of a wash. You can mm. you can definitely make arguments that, um, listen, it doesn't have uh, cholesterol, but it has a ton of sodium um, and uh, the amount of, you know, the a beef burger can have literally just a single ingredient in it. So, yeah. um the beef industry will say that's really great. But then, of course, you can make the argument that, um, well, sure, hidden in all that beef are a whole lot of, uh, you know, antibiotics that are fed to the animal, fed to the animals. Yeah. And, um, Sorry, I took us to a serious tone there. <laughs> I'm so sorry, right. guys. Tim, well, Tim will bring it back. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> if... I'm wondering about product pipelines here because for the last couple of years, the news from these companies has really been, hey, we're working on this chicken version of chicken. What is the product pipeline telling you about their new strategy? Well, when I spoke to uh, Dennis Woodside, who's the president at Impossible, he said, you know, listen, we're still working on mimicking that uh, whole muscle uh, kind of uh, format, which is like a chicken breast mm. or a steak. Um, and then he didn't put it this way exactly, but essentially what he was saying was, but this is so much easier. <laughs> like, I can just take the ground beef we already right. have and put it in a ravioli. All I have to do is, you know, make that business deal. And yeah. um, that's, not, that's a lot easier than making a, a fake chicken breast. All right. Well, I want real stuff in my ravioli. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, this story in the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week magazine, you can find it everywhere tomorrow. Uh, Bloomberg Business Week editor Jill Weber, who's got to take some, maybe some cooking lessons. And, uh, of course, Dina Shanker of Bloomberg News. February is Black History Month. Every day this month, we are celebrating significant moments in U.S. Black history. Now, with your installment for today is Bloomberg's Renita Young. On this day in black history in 1951, the New York City Council passes a bill prohibiting discrimination against African Americans in city-assisted housing. The bill was mainly directed at the Stuyvesant Town Housing Project, at the time a public-private partnership project. Managers of that development prohibited black tenants who had been active in the campaign to stop racial discrimination. Lawsuits were filed claiming that the project was public or semi-public and thus violated anti-discrimination laws for New York City public housing, which were rarely enforced. One month later, the Brown-Isaacs bill became law in New York City. That's Today in Black History. I'm Renita Young, Bloomberg Radio. A big thank you to Bloomberg's Renita Young for today's installment of Today in Black History. Coming up, we've got an interview with Carl Icahn right here on Bloomberg.
All right, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Tim T- Stenovic. We're going to toss over to our TV colleagues. We're getting ready for a sit down with Carl Icahn. You're watching Bloomberg. I'm Eric Schatzker, and I want to welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide to this global simulcast on Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, and YouTube as well. Carl Icahn, the billionaire investor and shareholder activist, has a starring role in a new HBO documentary, Icon, The Restless Billionaire. It examines his extraordinary career, and it also showcases the campaigns that we've been following for years. The chairman of Icon Enterprises is here with us right now. Carl Icon, welcome. Thank you. It's great Thank to see you. you, and it's especially great to see you, Carl, because I want to tell everybody It's your birthday. If I'm not mistaken, Carl, you're 86 years old today, and you are celebrating your birthday with us, us, which we're undoubtedly (laughs) quite happy about. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be doing it, Eric. Carl, you like to get into it, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, You predicted months ago that Fed stimulus would metastasize into inflation and fast become a problem for policymakers, for the economy, and of course for investors as well. This is a movie that you've seen before. You've seen it several times before. Carl, how does the movie end? It doesn't end happily. And uh, I've seen God knows how many bear markets, and they're similar in one way. It's, uh, It's a sad thing, and a lot of people lose a great deal of capital, and I am not predicting, though, Eric, I'm not predicting that we're in a bear market. I'm not predicting that this is going to end, sort of this euphoric atmosphere. But I am predicting this, that and it's not much of a prediction, I guess. But sooner or later, a situation like this is going to end relatively badly, some less badly, some more. But you can't keep printing up money and printing it up and printing it up because you get what you have now that you can't control. The government can't control inflation. It it controls it only uh, what they're doing, what Volcker had to do. You know, bring interest rates up to 18%. I remember those days. It was unbelievable. So I think that's going to happen, but I'm not here to discuss. I'm not a macroeconomics guru, and uh, I I just look at simple facts. That's That's all I do, simple facts. And a simple fact here is... Is t- the, the tension between inflation and printed up money can't continue to exist without busting open. You say, Carl, that you're not predicting a bear market, but this is going to end in an ugly way. What's the difference? Okay, well, I'm not predicting a near-term bear market. I, nobody can predict what's going to happen next week, next month, maybe even next year or two. You can't. You really can't predict it. Too many variables. Too many variables. The, the whole political scene the whole question of the presidency. But on a big picture methodology, you can look at it and say, it's simple. You can't, I think it's economics 101 in high school. You you can't just keep pushing out money. You can't just keep giving away money and giving away money, giving away money, because that money will definitely lose its worth like anything else. If you make too many widgets, then the widgets lose their worth. So here's what's happening. We keep putting out money, putting out money, putting out money. The Fed keeps pushing it out there. And that's great for a while. I mean, that's great. It's, it's like uh, makes you happy. But, and, and, and at times, it's certainly needed. But now you can't, that party has to stop. And sooner or later, what's going to happen is you just, and you're having it already now, the manifestations of it is, is rampant inflation. And and it's not there yet, but it has to be controlled. And it's not something that you can wait to see if it happens, because I've seen that in the past. You wait and you wait too long, maybe. But I'm not here to say the Fed's doing a bad job. In fact, I think the Fed has done a pretty good job over the last few years in sort of saving the economy. So uh, that's not the issue. But the issue is, uh, if, you, if you're asking me to predict something, I'm only saying, and it's not saying very much, I guess, that over the next three, four years, or maybe a lot sooner, you are going to see this whole thing hit the wall in one way or another, and it's not going to be a pretty outcome. Carl, but, but no, go ahead. 
Yeah, but but I'm not saying it's happening now. In fact, it, right now it, it might be there might be a lot of arguments on the bullish side right now. You know, these companies are flush with money. They may be doing a lot more buybacks. You know, the buybacks last year I think added a trillion dollars to the economy. So there's this, there could be a lot of bullish things that you could say for the, for, for the near term. Carl, so, is there is there an icon playbook for inflationary times? Are there things that you want to own at times like these and things that you're actively avoiding at times like these? Yeah, look, I mean, over the years, the paradigm that I find the best for investing, and it's obviously most people can't do it, is activism. And, and going into companies where the stock is selling cheaply for a number of reasons. And if we can get in there and we can do something, we can help that company. And sometimes we come as uninvited guests. But a lot of companies in this country are, ter are terribly run, just terribly run. And by the way, in my mind, that's the reason for the problems that we have today. You, you have companies that the CEOs are making 10, 15 million a year. And many of these guys are not capable of doing the job, with many, many exceptions. I want to say many exceptions, many very good CEOs. Good CEO is worth his salt, and, and you pay him, and if things are going well, I don't mind seeing that guy making a lot of money because he's producing. But there's so many bad ones and so many bad boards because the boards aren't doing the one job they're paid to do, which is make that CEO accountable. So those stocks go down, things get, get uh, into a problem, we come in, and that's our paradigm. We try to clean it up and, and just change a few simple things, or maybe more than a few simple things. And over the years, we added up since, uh, even since 2000, uh, uh, you, 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 if you bought our stock, IEP, which is sort of a surrogate for what we do, we have other money, but that's uh, what you could look at. If, if you uh, uh, put a, 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 if you put money into the, in the company that and bought that stock, you made today, if you look back, you, you made, if you reinvested the dividends, you made 1,900%. And I think the S&P is only 600%, 500% that you made. So the proof of the pudding is the eating. You did very well by following and doing this, that, what we do. There are ups and downs. It's not. It's a bumpy ride. Sometimes we lose for a few years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes secular changes. But the the issue I'm trying to make is that the reason we're successful is because you have this very strong problem in our economy today. There's no accountability. And while I believe, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but answer some questions. <laughs> you are, in fact, you are jumping ahead. And before we come back to activism, and we will. Uh, Carl, I want to introduce you to a colleague of mine, Taylor Riggs, and she has a question for you as well. Thank you, Eric. And Carl, it was so fascinating. You echoed similar comments when we spoke last May. And you talked about waiting for stocks to become cheaper, for you to really begin to look at them, to begin to enter. And I am curious if that process maybe already started for you in January, and if there were stocks where you looked and they were cheap, and we've started to already see some of that volatility, or is it still yet to come? Yeah, you know, okay, it, it's more, when you say the stock is cheap, it's cheap for us when we think the hidden value in the company. It's not that we're buying it because the market is cheap or the market's good, because we keep things hedged. We, we, we had that record, and we were hedged all along in bull markets, meaning that we have shorts on the S&P, for instance, or other shorts. So we, we buy what we think is good, and maybe in that industry we short a stock. I try to stay away as much as I can, and I've learned this lesson the hard way. Stay away from predicting the near-term movements of the market. I read all the guys, and they all have great ideas. But I tell you, I think there's just too many variables to tell you and even talk about what the market's going to do next week, next month. So we just find companies that we think are valuable if you do certain things, where you have poor managements and you can... Um, just uncover the hidden jewel, for instance. And, and we've done it a number of times. Uh, you know, you think back and some of them are obvious. You, sometimes it takes a few years to make it work, but... Uh, Carl? You, you look, yeah, okay, go ahead. You, you know, I, I was just going to say that in addition to, to, to obviously, you know, putting up an extraordinary track record as an activist, you are a pretty good trader. 
Um, you've been active on occasion, right, in commodities or derivatives such as the CMBX. And I'm just wondering at a time like this, given the conditions that you described, whether you have any trades like that on. Yeah, well, the CBX is a good example. The CBX, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, story, but... The mall CBX, short, as it's called. Yeah, it's sort of a mall short. So to make it simple, it's a little bit like 08. It's analogous to 08, and that's why it's very worrisome. Just like all those mortgages fell apart, in the CMBX, you have like $25 billion invested in 25 deals. But the, but the, but the real, it's almost, that $25 billion, believe it or not, is a tail wag of the dog because you could do a CDS, which is a very complicated derivative. But in simplicity, it's buying insurance. So you're going and you're buying insurance on those deals. So basically, you're buying insurance on a mall. Oh, it's not it's not on one wall, but I'm just making a, an analogy. And what happens is this market, I believe, and I say this, and I think it's maybe it'd be unpopular. We're, we have that insurance. We made a fair amount of money by buying that insurance on the malls. But I believe that market is manipulated quite a bit, just as in 08. And maybe to some extent it's legal, maybe mm -hmm. not. So you have these large mutual funds that sell that insurance, some of them, not many. And then they go out and they sell the shorts and it's called a CDF. And I believe, well, to begin with, I don't, I don't believe that they disclose the risk of, of that CDS. That CDS is extremely risky. And, they, and there are not many funds that do it, but there are a few that specialize, not specialized, but do it. And they actually deceive the people buying it by telling them, or not disclosing to them, the risk there is in that. I mean, that's why we're making money on the insurance because there were a lot of people, Mrs. Jones out in Iowa somewhere, I think she's buying treasuries. Because what they do is tell people, you know, this is uh, similar to treasuries. And then what they do, so then when the insurance comes due, so say you own the insurance, I make it simple. When the insurance comes due, they don't want to pay the insurance. I've, so it's analogous to having insurance on health, let's say on your health. You uh -huh. have insurance on and and you get sick. How would you like it if the insurance company basically, I'm, I'm putting it very bluntly, pay off the doctor or threaten the doctor to say the guy's not sick so they don't have to pay the insurance? And that's what is going on today in such certain cases where we're looking into and we have evidence that that goes on. Are you and we're fighting that. So that's an area where uh, we think... There could be a lot of manipulation, but okay, but that's a sort of specialized thing. And Very specialized, but as you pointed out, um, in that short position that you had via the CMBX, you made a lot of money. I remember seeing uh, a report, in fact, that we published back in 2020. You'd made more than a billion dollars. Are you, do you, are you still short the CMBX? Yeah, we're still short it. I, 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 we didn't quite make a billion, but we made maybe 600 million, something like that, 700 million, which is great. I'm, I'm not crying about it, but I just want to correct what you <laughs> I suspect. I suspect not. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we still believe, in other words, some of these malls have come better. Than, it's a real complicated issue. I'm just talking about where you see manipulation happening similar to what happened in 08. I see right. a similarity. So uh, be good. I, I want to ask you, Carl, about McDonald's. I'm really intrigued by your dispute with McDonald's. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, but what you've effectively done is make an issue of animal welfare. You're fighting for better treatment of, of pigs, and you're fighting with the world's largest fast food chain. How come? Yeah, I, it's not that I'm picking a fight with McDonald's because McDonald's is not a company that we own stock in. We own 100 shares. So it's not that we own stock in it or trying to make a profit there. But over the years, uh, I don't do much about it. But for one reason or another, I really do feel emotional about these animals and the unnecessary suffering you put them through. They take these pigs, and a pig is, an, is you know, a pig has a good brain, and, and, and it's a feeling animal. And they take these animals up for no reason. I say no reason. Put them in these gestation crates now. They didn't used to do it 20, 30 years ago. We've become worse, not better. It's almost sadistic. You put them in this, say, this crate for its whole life, a crate where the pig can't move. It just can't move around. And they could easily not do it. 
So 10 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, uh, my daughter worked for the Humane Society. And she called me up and said, you know, look, Dad, and, and she knows I, I hate to see a suffering of animals. I, I was uh, fourth in my regiment in, in, in the Army shooting a rifle. So I, I'm a good shot and I get invited to go hunting. I never went hunting in my life. I just hate to see suffering for no reason. And I'm not trying to be holier than thou, sanctimonious, but I said, hey, wait a minute. That's terrible what goes on, and they won't call you back. So they said, they'll call me back. So I called, them, I called the CEO back. I said, they're going to call me. And they called me up, and then we, I discussed it with him. We said, Mr. Icar, we agree with you, Carl. CEO said, I agree with you, and we agree. And we're going to try to stop this, and we will make a pledge that within 10 years, there'll be no gestation rates. The Humane Society accepted that, so I, I, I probably would have been tougher on it, but we did it. And now they just never delivered. They did a little something, but never delivered. And so they called me up again. And I was really teed off because here they had promised this and I didn't even know that they didn't deliver or anything like that. So we're telling them, hey, look, you guys promised that you are going to not buy the trim as part of this if if uh, if it means that you're buying it for those that that that, that those that produce the pigs, so to speak, in, in these gestation crates, so keep them in the gestation crates. So that's what's going on. And we are probably... 90% there of putting up a slate. You know, we're not going to fool around with them anymore. Putting up a slate and say, hey, you got to live up to your promise and you got to do this. Seriously, then, you're going to wage, you're, this is important enough to you that you're willing to wage a proxy fight over it with McDonald's. I'll put up a few, you know, a slate, a few people and wage it. I, I really think, though, it's getting this story out because I think it's obscene with, with, with chickens, with things where they don't have to suffer. And I mean, it's it's almost you know they're they're out dancing. The CEO of McDonald makes over ten million dollars a year. Everybody's having a party, and maybe he's operating it well. But why the heck can't you just do something? And and they say they will pay a premium for it if it's not done in a gestation crate. In fairness to them, and we are talking to them, and we intend to do it with other in other areas where there's unnecessary animal suffering. I didn't realize how bad it was myself until my daughter really showed it to me. She's a vegetarian, she's into this stuff. And my son too feels strongly so, about it. Uh, other, other areas opens up, I don't want to call it a Pandora's box, but Carl, the catalog of animal abuses by the agribusiness industry is enormous. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the horrifying footage from, from poultry farms, right? The way they treat chickens. There's some similar so stuff that goes on with cattle, and there's other stuff, I should add, that goes on with pigs. What does this mean? I, you know, <laughs> tangling with Carl Icahn on a matter of, you know, yeah. who sits on the board is one thing, but this is a big issue, and I'm just curious to know whether you're willing to put your money and your word and your actions behind. I just want to get a sense of what you have in mind. We're, 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 we're going to fight it as much as we can. It, 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 you know, it's a movement that people now feel strongly about. And it's unnecessary to have this suffering, really unnecessary. It, it's not something where you can say, well, it's for the good of humanity and we got to do, I mean, and even that is very unnecessary, all the medical testing they do. But at least there's an argument in some cases that you have to do it. Here, you don't have to keep this pig stuck in this gestation crate. You could change it. Of course, they have arguments of why they do it. But there is no argument for this suffering. It, it just gets you angry. The pig has to spend his whole life in this crate, or now they say they take him out for a little bit, and not be able to move. Look, the, the pig's going to get killed. OK, I'm not, I'm not being the holier than thou and say, well, you can't eat meat because the pig wants to live for years. But OK, the pig is killed, but doesn't have to suffer for four years and then get killed. It really gets me upset when we talk about it. And, and I'm not being sacrimonious about it, but it, it's something that I think I can help to some extent, you know, ameliorate it to some extent. And I think I'm gonna, we're going to do it. But that doesn't take away from what I think I do best is picking these stocks and, and, uh, and, and creating, creating value for all shells. We, cre we create, I mean, just to digress, we created a trillion dollars of value for all shells. I'm not going away from that. But this is an area that, uh, 
Well, I, I let me put it this way. I can think of a number of animal rights activists who would love to have Carl Icahn in their corner <laughs> waging proxy battles with the likes of McDonald's and others. Carl, but I would like to introduce another of my colleagues, Romain Bostic, and he has a question for you as well. Uh, Carl, I, I want to talk a little bit about commodities and get your thoughts uh, on what some people say is sort of a new super cycle that we're seeing, particularly in the energy sector and particularly with some of the tailwinds that we're seeing out there because of the shift or at least, I guess, the dabbling right now with renewable energy sources. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's a huge question and you could go on for hours and hours on it. We are involved in Occidental, as you probably know, and we have a lot of that. Oh, and, and that has got the benefit of the sub-cycle now. It's sort of amazing, isn't it, that less than, than I think, March, a, a, a year ago March, so it's less than a year, you could buy, and we have a refinery, we have a refiners, and we actually bought oil for minus $30 a barrel. That's how bad it was. And now that same barrel, the same thing has gone up, WTI has gone up to over 90. And I'll tell you, I don't think there's anybody in this this country smart enough to have made that bet. You know, say, you know, would make the bet that I think anybody would give you 50 to one odds then that if you tell them when, when that oil was selling for negative, they paid you to take the oil because they couldn't, they couldn't uh, store it. And and we bought it in our refinery, not much. I wish we had bought more, but we couldn't. But, well, you know, it, for one reason or another, we couldn't have the storage space. But we, wherever we had storage space, we cleaned it up and took that oil. It, it, and I think you would have been 100 to 1 odds. You would have given somebody, if, if you said, well, before March of next year, you know, in fact, in February, that same oil is going to sell at over 90. So it's how, how crazy the commodities are. So we own stocks in them. But I'll tell you, and sometimes we trade the oil market because, you know, we, we own uh, we own the refineries and and, and and one thing I'm very bullish on, I, and obviously people uh, uh, know this, that um, on LNG, for instance, Chenier. I mean, look how great that company's done. And that's an act. That was activism helped out a lot. We got in there, and the CEO was changed, and uh, the new CEO is doing a great job, and uh, the stock has gone up tremendously. This LNG, for instance, I'm sure you think is really interesting, but that you might have predicted. You might have predicted that the world needs, the world needs energy, needs electricity, and where is it going to get the electricity the outside of this country? So we make all this uh, gas, and if you could turn it into LNG, li liquid natural gas, and you turn it into that, you're going to be able to, uh, and now it's come to fruition because you're going to be able to produce electricity for Europe and, and Asia and what have you. So I'm certainly bullish on that for the mm -hmm. long term. And... Uh, but trading commodities is not my thing. Every time I just try to trade them, every time I try to trade them uh, without just a long-term uh, thought, it's very hard to to do it because there's so many, again, variables, and suddenly it hits you that you're wrong. Oh, my God, this has happened, that's happened. And in the stock, you say, I don't care if you're wrong. I'll just buy more of this company. I'm an activist. I'm going to make it work. But suddenly, one reason or another, I remember the days we owned Freeport, we made a few bucks on it, but not much because we, we just couldn't hold on. There were so many factors coming in at you from Indonesia and whatever that it's not a game for me. But some people, I think, do Carl, well with it. Carl, could we go back to activism for a moment? And for those who are just joining us on Bloomberg Television, on Bloomberg Radio, on YouTube, and of course on the Bloomberg Terminal, we're speaking with Carl Icahn, the billionaire activist and chairman of Icahn Enterprises. Carl, the SEC has proposed a number of new rules that, at least on the surface, threaten to thwart activists like you. And I don't want to get into a catalog of, of the rules and their prescriptiveness, but, you know, it would force you to disclose stakes faster. It would force you to disclose economic interests through derivatives and not just common shares. Um, it would expand the definition of a group. I, I want to know what you make of these proposed rules and the impact that they'll have on activism. It's interesting. I, I mean, there are rules that the SEC are promoting that I think are sort of necessary without getting into details. I thought I think there are abuses, like I just said in the uh, CMBX area. There are abuses by even you know by even these mutual funds and even these investment bankers and, and, and guys I know and friendly with. However, the one that I'm adamantly against, and not and really again, <laughs> I'm saying. 
not because it relates to me, which it does. It does relate to me to some extent. But in a way, in a very uh, ironic way, it might even help me. But what they're doing now is throwing out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to activism. Because I completely, totally believe this, that this country, this country, one of the real problems of this country, I said it before and maybe that one of our problems is that we have great corporations, but many of them are terribly managed. And that's one of the problems we have. We have the wrong guys running a lot of these companies. And there's no way to get rid of them. There really is, because there really is no corporate democracy today. I mean, corporate democracy is an oxymoron, because you really don't have fair votes. You, 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 I mean, and I'm not saying something people haven't almost agreed about, that you, you, you really, to go in and fight a company, it costs you a great deal of money. First of all, they beat you up with PR. But I've been through it, so that's what I'm saying. This, these rules don't affect me as much. They, they beat you up with PR. It's, it's more of a feudalistic system to be euphemistic. Which, which is the rule specifically that, 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 that you think would affect you and perhaps other people too? The rule that they're trying to push now is the 10-day rule, where you, if you buy stock, so you want to, so an activist wants to accumulate some stock. He says, okay, I'm going to face all these problems. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to have to put up with the PR. I'm going to have to spend a great deal of money proxy fight. I, I mean, in a political election, you, you put the guy in jail if, if, you're, if you're the president and you use the money, the, the government's money, to go fight, to go fight the, uh, the in the political arena. Here, you have to you have to do all these things. So, but the one thing the activist might be able to make money with is he buys stock first, and he has, and then he gets to five percent, and then they let you buy stock for another five six days, so you accumulate some stock, and then when it gets out, if 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 he has a ch if he has a chance, or he gets the company to sell themselves or do all these things, he makes some money for all the work he did. Otherwise, why should an activist even do it? He I buys see. A little, and then why so do it's it's do it? it's it's disincentivizing activism. Have mm -hmm. I got that right? Obviously, disincentivizing something that should be done. Now, I do agree because I I want to be fair about this to the SEC. I do agree with some of the criticism. And so you, you, the criticism basically is some guy goes in and says, hey, look, I'm going to be real smart about this. I'm sort of a known guy. I'm going to buy this stock. And, 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 and you know, I'm just going to get it there. Now I'm going to get the PR out there. And some of these activists do that. They get PR. They get articles. Oh, I just bought the stock. Isn't that wonderful? And, and the stock goes up, and then he sells it. And I think that is a legitimate ah, criticism. The, sh the short-term game, in other words. Game. So I would suggest, and I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm writing a paper on it, that it's fair to say that the activist can't make that short-term gain. He has to disgorge it. In other words, if he's, do, if he's a, an activist, he's buying it for the good of the shareholders, he's saying, and to some extent, for the good of the company, I'm going to wage a proxy fight or whatever. He has to keep it for a certain amount of time, as you have in, in the many cases with boards, and he has to keep it with a certain amount of time. But let's say he buys it and the stock and, and, and he gets that extra five days or seven days and he accumulates some stock. And then the stock does go up because he bought it. At least he's going to make some money if the company does go out and sell itself or, or does other things that he suggests. So otherwise, what this rule is going to do is actually discourage activism even more than it is discouraged today. And just to add to what I said before, I think that's a very bad thing for economic society because right now... You need activists. Right now, yeah, you absolutely need them more and more now. We, right now, we, we, we have inflation, we have badly run companies that are not accountable. And the boards really don't do their job. So you do need activism, and this is going to be almost the last nail in the coffin. There were a lot of nails in that coffin already. You know, the <laughs> Carl, I, I know I, I, I want to move on to ask you a question, and, and I'll preface it by saying this. I know how much you don't love talking about politics, but I do have to ask you about um, somebody whom you know well, Donald Trump. Everybody knows that you supported him you know, in his presidential campaign. Um, and on occasion, you functioned as something, I would say, of, uh, as something of an informal advisor 
you and he t talked about some issues together. Um, because of that, people would like to know, and I'd like to know, if he were to run in 2024, would you support him? Yeah, it's a good question, and I would, I would have to think about that quite a bit. I think Trump did a lot of good things. And I disagree with him on a number of things. And, and you know, I'm obviously have a big business to run and spend a lot of time on it. And I wasn't able to go down to Washington a lot. In fact, I don't think I ever went down there except for the inauguration, even though I was invited down there by Donald. I, I basically i am not a guy that gets to politics. I think Donald's done a lot of good things. He's done things I disagreed with. However, I will tell you, and I've been around a long time, I've never seen Washington as confused as it is today. Who do you blame and, and that on? The history book. I, I look, it's obvious. I mean, I don't want to get into politics here too much, but I would say that, that right now, I think that we, we have just made tremendously poor decisions in the last six months. I mean, go from Afghanistan to, to other uh, political decisions. I really don't want to get into too much. I, I don't want this to be a political thing. No, I I'm understand. But I, I, and I framed the question very narrowly because I didn't want it to become an expansive discussion about politics. But you're not decided, it sounds to me, if you would or would not support him in 2024. Uh, does that depend on whether he does or doesn't or, or who's running against him? One thing, the way it is today, there's no question in my mind, I would, re I would support any Republican that's nominated for the presidency, uh, uh, the, way, the way this, this plays out today. And I would, would support any Republican candidates in November, because right now, this, this is this, I, I, I'm not saying people, you know, that you don't know this, but, but it, it's, it's a rudderless ship right now. So I would, I would do that. So I would support anyone that's doing it, but I am not. I'm not saying that you know Trump is necessarily the right guy. I'm not saying he's the wrong guy. I I just you know haven't spoken to him for quite a while, and uh, not that I wouldn't speak to him. I mean you know we're we're, we're friends and all, but I haven't spoken to him at all, and uh, I'm not sure it matters a hell of a lot who I support anyway. So <laughs> well, one yeah. of the things that's that's fueling. The disagreement in Washington that you make reference to is inequality, and you've raised concerns about income and wealth inequality in America, and you've connected the inequality problem with compensation in many respects, CEO compensation, compensation for bankers that you consider overblown relative to you know, what they're contributing. You've probably noticed, Carl, that CEO compensation and compensation in general on Wall Street is going through the roof. There are some bank CEOs who are making upwards of $30 million a year. And in fact, there are two current CEOs on Wall Street who are billionaires. What do you make of that? I, I, I just said to you before, there is no accountability in a corporation. So by definition, you're going to expect that. If you, if you, hey, if, if you were running, you're running your program here, you do a great job. Okay. But if there was no, and if it was up to you, and you ran all of uh, Bloomberg, hey, if it was up to you, wouldn't you give yourself raises and raises and raises? I mean, the, the boards do nothing. If the board does nothing and they say, hey, you go and say, I'm going to leave, buddies, if you don't give me a raise, well, of course. So you have no accountability at these companies. And look, I've lived it. I don't think that, I honestly don't think that the SEC, that I am not criticizing the SEC because they're doing some stuff they should be doing. A lot of it, they should be doing. But... I am saying that if you really understood what went on at these companies, which we do, or I do, you would be saying you can't believe it. I mean, they're, they're, well, uh, uh, maybe to jump ahead, and I think maybe it'll interest some of your shareholders, uh, we're, we're in a proxy fight now with the Southwest. Sure. Southwest, I think. And that's the quintessential example of what I'm talking about. You, you, you got, you got a, a board... That's basically just a do-nothing kind of board. Well, you've been, I mean, that's a situation where you've, I mean, I, I'm, I, honestly, Carl, I'll ask you because you raised it. You've, you've played some, some pretty big cards already, right? You, you've proposed dumping the entire board, if I'm not mistaken. You're opposed to their purchase of Questar pipelines and the manner in which they're financing it. 
Um, you know, you've made, a ten, you've made a tender offer for the company. What's next? I I mean, how do you win? I, I'm only saying to you that it's an example. I, I mean, we really, that we are making that tender offer and we believe it'll be successful. We believe we're paying $75, the stock would be 61 or something. If we weren't there, it's now 66 or something. They, and it's a good test. But we think we've met every condition you need for that tender offer. And uh, they, they, they keep coming up and say it's conditional. Well, it's conditional on the poison pill. But I mean, the simple strategy is, you know, if, if we have that tender offer and they got the poison pill, then if they vote us into power, not us, but we have an independent board for the most part, goes into power, they, they drop the pill. They say they will. Then we can pay them. They, they, they have a condition. There's a condition where there's regulatory agencies in three states. But I don't think we violated any of the rules of those regulatory agencies. In so it, so it's just a matter of time, you think, before you, end, so. you merge I, victorious? I, I look, I'm sure it's litigation, but I believe it's a matter of time. But okay. I, I, about that tender, we just talked about the tender. But to get back to the original point, the country, and you, you making the point very well, Eric, that there is no question that... The whole system is almost, it's sort of, a, it's sort of a, a vicious cycle where each group that's in power wants to, you know, help the other group because they help each other, and therefore you have this great overpayment. But that's not even the real reason that you have the problems. You, the overpayment is just a manifestation. We have great companies. These companies can produce. They're not producing because you have bad managements and boards that will do nothing about it. And it takes a guys, and I'm not trying to uh, pra praise myself, but it takes guys like us, activists, to go in and shake them up. And It's your business. The reason that, that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If, if you bought the stocks we bought, you know, over the years, we made over a trillion dollars for shareholders just by increasing and enhancing value. Not because we're geniuses, not I when you even saying we're great operators, but just by cleaning up the mess. I'm curious, so, Carl, to know, in the course of waging those battles, who you go to. Who's your go-to guy on Wall Street? I, I, I asked you about bankers and banker compensation, but I'm equally interested to know, when you want somebody in your corner, a bank, a banker, a CEO, Wall Street CEO, who do you turn to? Yeah, I, I mean, we have a couple of favorite bankers. I mean, to, to raise us capital, but basically we use the banks not so much for strategy. No, no, no. I realize you use them, but I, raise but I want to raise could... capital, and 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 we've used. Uh, look, we we found uh, in one deal we 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 did we found Citibank to be very very effective. Jefferies is another company that's very effective in raising in capital, as far as we we're concerned, and we work with them. And while I think we overpay for all this stuff. It's not outrageous with them as it is with some of these companies. Some of these very high, gilt edge companies, the, 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 what they charge is completely outrageous. I mean, but, and I've said it. I look, I agree with you completely. <laughs> that this whole area is completely. Look, I I believe that if a CEO is really good and he's got his stock way up, and the shells are making a great deal of money, okay, he does deserve to be compensated because maybe he can go somewhere else and do the job. He did a great job. So I'm not saying that. Or somebody risks his money. He goes into a deal. He buys a stock. He helps, uh, he helps that company or, or whatever. But he risks his money. He deserves it. But these guys, these CEOs and, and these uh, guys, I, I mean, it's almost, it's almost like on a comedy show. The CEO does a terrible job, so his options don't come in. So he complains. He says, hey, I'm not making money on my options. So, board, what you got to do is lower the, lower the striking price of the options so I can make money. He's done a terrible job. But he says, but hey, you got to lower the price of the option, and the boards do it. And we well, jump up and scream about it, but what the hell can you do, you know? Spe speaking I mean, of comedy, those who watch the HBO documentary will see a clip of a routine that you once put on at Caroline's, the comedy club here in New York City. But I also mentioned the documentary, Carl, because I watched it last night, and, and it left me with two unanswered questions that I'd like to get to before you and I wrap up. And the first concerns succession at Icon Enterprises. It's not exactly clear coming out of that movie whether your son Brett will or won't take over for you at Icon Enterprises. 
Have you decided? I, I don't even think it's a decision. I mean, what's, what, what Brett said is sort of true, I, and, and, and I think he summed it up. I, look, as long as I'm healthy, I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm an old guy, but, you know, I haven't lost my marbles, and I think I'm real good at what I do. You know, I sort of over the years perfected what I do, and I enjoy it. So I don't want to, you know, give up the reins, and, and maybe I could get a few things done in different areas. But after that, you know, Brett is a very competent guy. And, and I think it's going to work out that he... But Brett is... I don't think anyone would say it himself. He's not an operator so much as somebody that goes out and sort of does what I do. And by the way, I'm not an operator either. In other words, I don't go in and take any credit for saying, I'm going to this company and I'm telling you you should uh, build a building here or we should do that. We, we get into those companies and make sure the operator is producing the numbers he thinks he'll do or that he should be doing and mm -hmm. helping them with M&A. We're, we're really good at M&A. So when, when they want to raise money for something, we look at that and say, that makes sense. Let's do it. And then we, 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 we get the money for them and that kind of thing. And that's what Brett is very good at. And I think uh, forgetting that he's my son, I think he'd be the kind of candidate I would have to be the successor. So... Uh, I, I, and obviously, I think Brett himself would admit or realize it and, and say it that he's not the guy that's going to be the, the guy, the hands-on guy at the different companies to operate them. But that's not what we do. And you know, we we no. have we have good guys running the companies, or we only on only on rare occasions. Um, the second question I have, Carl, for you is about um, legacy. This 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 unanswered question, if you will, from the from the documentary. You signed the Giving Pledge, and, and in the film, Bill Gates says that means you've committed to giving away more than half your wealth. Um, I know from Mike Bloomberg that giving away many billions of dollars is, is challenging, right? It takes thought, it takes time, it takes effort. And, and here we are, as I mentioned at the outset, it's your birthday, you're 86 years old, and I'm kind of curious to know, you know, when do you start giving away a whole lot of money? Well, I mean... We we I just uh, we just gave another forty million to Mount Sinai toward the uh, you know we have that Mount Sinai hospital and then you know we have the Icon Stadium over the years we we've, we've given away and that's sort of interesting I've given away money for these colleges and and I can name a few Chode and all that their buildings Princeton we gave mm -hmm. a building to so we have given away a lot of money where I and I think they probably like it. I don't personally get too involved. You know, a lot of guys like to go on the boards of these things and go on the boards of the institutions. I mean, and, and uh, honestly speaking, the only thing that I'm getting involved to because I can I can help it is this animal rights thing, where I think there's a way that I can be really helpful to seeing that happen. Because I think that's that's a situation that's just horrible. It's obscene. You, you got you got these companies making all this money and these animals just suffering for no reason. Okay, yeah. well, I'm not going to keep repeating it. So I think that's something that, you know, I would, uh, you know, the foundations that we have would be much more involved with this animal rights thing. Uh, and obviously we have a lot of money, so we'd be on to other things. And um, the foundation itself is, is, is still, I mean, there'll be certainly enough money if I get out of the business for any reason, IEP will still have, I mean, it's not going to affect the amount of capital they have today. And, 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 and uh, I mean, there's, they're, a, they're a public company, so mm -hmm. the money that they have today is not going to be affected, nor would I want that stock sold. I think I'd like to see that as a legacy to continue. And I think uh, if you ask, well, who's the guy that's going to run it? I, I think Brett is, is learned enough and is, is, is quite fit to do that. As, and I say that the operation would continue very much in the way it is now, where I don't really get in, nor would Brett, and tell these guys how they should operate the company day to day. But, but hold their feet to the fire if they're not producing, unless there's a reason not to. I mean, if you have a terrible recession, you can't blame somebody for not making money. So I think that's where it's going. <laughs> well, as always, Carl, 
we can't wait to see what you do next because it's always fascinating and clearly Brett will be with you doing that. Um, I'll say happy birthday once again. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Carl Icahn is the chairman of Icahn Enterprises. Uh, thrilled to have you here on Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, YouTube, the Bloomberg Terminal, Carl. I look forward to our next conversation. All right, of course, that was Eric Schatzker with uh, Carl Icahn turning 86 today. Check out that full conversation. You can listen to it, watch it at Bloomberg.com. Well, let's get a check of the market standing by. We've got Charlie Pellet. Uh, hey, thank Charlie. Thank you very much. 15 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell. The Dow lower right now, S&P higher. In the green, up by 10 points. NASDAQ lower by two. A couple of minutes ago, we did have the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all advancing. Indeed, choppy session as I speak. All three now turning positive. We've got uh, the NASDAQ 100 index. Index higher, also a little changed, up by three points. S&P up by two tenths of one percent. Ten-year yield two point oh two percent. Gold, spot gold up one percent, eighteen seventy-one the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate crude down one point three percent, ninety eighty-six a barrel. Icon Enterprises Chairman Carl Icon wrapping up a wide-ranging interview here on Bloomberg Radio. You heard him touch on a number of topics, including his strategy for getting involved in companies, animal welfare, and the markets. And here's what he had to say about about the inflation outlook. I just look at simple facts. That's what that's all I do. Simple facts. And a simple fact here is is t the, the tension between inflation and printed up money can't continue to exist without busting up. Icon, by the way, is 86. It's his birthday today. And here's what he had to say about succession at his company. As long as I'm healthy, I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm an old guy, but, you know, I haven't lost my marbles. And I think I'm real good at what I do. You know, I sort of over the years perfected what I do. And I enjoy it. And again, recapping, stocks now higher across the board with the S&P up 14, higher by three-tenths of 1%. Now, a look at world and national news as we head down to the 991 newsroom. Here she is, Nancy Lyons. Thanks, Charlie. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Brussels. He's hoping to reinforce America's commitment to its allies as Russia still masses along Ukraine's border. This is a very uh, challenging time. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the alliance has, has, got, has, has only grown, uh, grown stronger here. Defense Secretary Austin, so far the West has seen no sign of a promised pullback of Russian troops, despite the Kremlin saying it is withdrawing from the border. President Biden is holding a meeting today with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz to discuss the latest developments. As states one by one announce the end of requirements to wear masks or to show proof of vaccination, the CDC is still studying whether and when to join in, Bloomberg's Zerf Chapman reports. Dr. Anthony Fauci summed up the progress. The dynamics of COVID-19 outbreak continue to point in a sharp downward direction. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky reported 40 percent fewer cases than last week. We want to give people a break from things like mask wearing, and we are all cautiously optimistic about the trajectory we are on. Dr. Walensky said the decision will be based not only on numbers of new cases, but also the ability of hospitals to cope, not only with what is now 9,500 new COVID patients a day, but also to care for heart attack and accident victims. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. President Biden is ordering the release of Trump White House visitor logs to the House Committee investigating the riot of January 6th. It's another rejection of former President Trump's claims of executive privilege. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Back to you, Carol and Tim. I'm driving in my car. Now, yeah, but you let me drive. Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive home. Excuse me, I want to drive. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That punk to music will drive us until the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, just about 12 minutes left in today's trading session. We've definitely seen a reversal, and we are hovering near our best levels of the session. So we've gone from red to green when it comes to the equity trade, and that is following the latest Fed minutes from the Federal Reserve. It was that January meeting. I really think the takeaway, and our, our Markets Live blog has been just great on this, that 
basically there was nothing there that made investors think that the Fed is going to be more hawkish than it was already anticipated. Keep in mind, the market's already pretty aggressive about what the Fed may exactly. do come March. Exactly. More hawkish is, I think, the key there, yep. Carol, right? Not much new in there in terms of new hawkish signs in the Fed minutes. Let's chat all about it, that and more with Jimmy Lee, the founder and CEO of the Wealth Consulting Group. Uh, $2.7 billion in assets under management. Jimmy joins us once again on the phone from Las Vegas. Jimmy, how are you? Great. Great to uh, hear from you guys. Yeah, it's good to have you back with us. Um, help us make sense of, of this market right now. Um, we not just have you know investors trying to figure out the Fed's next move. We have investors concerned about the hottest inflation print in 40 years. And then we have geopolitical tensions on the border of Russia, Ukraine. Help us make sense of it. Well, I think until we get past uh, the Fed meeting in March, we're going to see some days where we get some wild uh, swings in the market uh, and volatility. And so, you know, until the Russia-Ukraine situation uh, settles itself out, and we'll know that pretty soon, I think, um, that's the, the one thing besides the Fed meeting that's coming up where people are speculating whether the Fed uh, will raise rates by 50 basis points or less. Uh, I'm in the thinking that it's not going to be 50, but uh, there's speculation about that, and you're going to have people on uh, your show and, and, and commentators are, that think both ways, so... I think the the market, the economy can absolutely stand 50. So if that were to happen and we get some short-term volatility from either that or an invasion into Ukraine, I still think uh, I'm constructive on equities for this year and the economy. And uh, I would use that as a buying opportunity if you're a stock investor. You know, it's interesting on the equity side of things, right, Jimmy, is that right now a lot of investors are a lot more aggressive in their thoughts about how aggressive the Fed will be in raising rates. Um, you know, we were talking with our Kathleen Hayes in terms of the balance sheet. There's a very big difference. And that's still in question how the Fed approaches this. And there's a difference between letting a runoff or actually actively selling um, assets off the balance sheet. There are still a lot of unknowns. We know the Fed's going to raise rates. At this point, it's aggressive. If the Fed is a little bit more dovish, what would that mean potentially for the equity markets? That could put it in a really good place. Uh, I agree, and that's actually what I think is going to happen, Carol. Mm. I think that uh, you know the hawkish signaling that the Fed has, has made uh, absolutely gives them some room to back off of that statement or those statements. And uh, the people that are predicting seven rate hikes, I think, are going to be wrong. And so I think the supply situation gets better first. And then, as they've said, they're going to be very data dependent and very flexible every single meeting. And uh, I don't see them raising rates as as high as some people think. And I think the long part of the bond market agrees with that. So you don't see the long end of the market really going up that much. And um, I think that right. the bond investors on that side are, are disagreeing with people that think the Fed is going to be very hawkish. Well, we saw the bond market just come in just a little bit on yield. I mean, a hair, just, you know. And what's interesting is in that FOMC minutes um, that, again, we heard from those members that price pressures would moderate uh, and the default setting of, of that, the issue will work itself out, Tim. That is still there by uh, members of the FOMC. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jimmy, I want to dig into what you were saying about bu- this being a buying opportunity between now and the next meeting of the Federal Reserve. W- what type of, what to you is sort of a bottom for the current cycle that we're in? Well, I think we've seen a lot of support at around 10% on the S&P 500 mm-hmm. uh, during the days that we saw it cross intraday. And uh, I, I would see that, I would see, let, let's say, for example, if we get an invasion into Ukraine, um, maybe it could go down a little further. Um, if the Fed raises 50 basis points, maybe we could see hitting that 10% number again. But I would see aggr- I would I would think that we would get aggressive buying at around that 10% number again. And so, you know, I'm bullish um, as long as earnings continue to look good. And I think earnings can look better in the latter part of this year if costs come down a little bit. And so if the shortage on the supply situation improves a bit, and, um, and we're already seeing some signs of that, by the way. One of the indexes we follow is the uh, the shipping index out of London, and costs have come down by like two thirds in over the last month or two. And so, so certainly supplies, the supply situation. You hear lots of different stories, but I think the the, the supply side and the expense uh, that companies have to deal with will get better. And so, if earnings can hold up uh, partially due to that, and also the strong consumer, I think that uh, equities from here on out, if we end up with high single digits for the year would be very good. So, Jimmy, you, you think inflation has peaked? You know, I think there's a good chance it has. And wow. um, I think that, uh, yes, I, I do. 
And I know it's a little bit of a contrarian view, but I, I believe that the Fed ultimately could be right that it, that it was transitory or it will be transitory. Wow. Um, it's a long, certainly be is it, I, you're like the only one, it, it, it might be, you know, rel- know, relatively lonely in that corner. But people have talked about peak inflation. They have, but, you know, we're still seeing, yeah, they have, but, you know, it hasn't really turned out that way. Well, the, the data, right, the data points. Yeah, that's the problem. This is, it's a tricky time. So. I know you don't talk stocks, sectors. Where should we be, though, at this point, Jimmy? Um, we, we're using a barbell strategy, and we still believe that it's better to be in some of the more economy-opening cyclical sectors. And so we're overweight energy, financials, uh, industrials, materials. But I think people will go back into growth stocks, and uh, but quality growth stocks, so mm. companies that have good earnings. Um, obviously, the, the companies that have been hit the most with the highest valuations that don't really have great earnings. I don't know if investor money will flow back into those as aggressively as they may some of the mega cap stocks that, that investors have been, you know, invested in for a long time. Also for listeners, you know, in past Fed tightening cycles, stocks have done very well. So equities have been right. a good asset class during tightening cycles and actually growth as beat value in those past time periods. Although this time around, I think it's dangerous to say, but I think it is a little bit different in the sense that, uh, I think the, the value sectors will, will be doing very well. And also, it, it's important for investors not to be too underweight overseas. Mm. And so I think international markets will do better as well. Yeah, we've heard that too. Although, you know, what's interesting, and I guess we'll have to watch the economic data points, um, the Fed in their minutes also talked a lot about Omicron and its potential to weigh on output and also talked about future variants. And we know our reporting to our, I think, of our Michelle Cortez story over the weekend that we're not out of the pandemic and we're not out of the pandemic until everybody's out of the pandemic. So that continues to be something, uh, Jimmy, that certainly can impact the trade and where the opportunities are. Yeah, and I've got one, you know, I was listening to on the commercial break there, um, uh, Dr. Fauci's interview. Mm-hmm. Regardless of where we're at with the, with the case count, it, it's, it's pretty evident now that uh, we're opening up the economy and they're getting rid of things like the mask mandates in a lot of states. And so I don't see a reversal on that. I mm-hmm. really don't. And, so, and, and also investors have not really understood that there's probably not going to be any tax hikes this year. So they'll understand that once we get closer to April and uh, people are talking to their accountants. But without tax hikes in a midterm election year, whereas I think whether, you know, I don't really care what side somebody's on on the political side, but uh, there's a little momentum for the GOP, I think. And I think from an investor standpoint, you know, not any more new regulations and things like that uh, will seem bullish. Yeah. And uh, I think it'll, it'll, you know, promote risk taking. All right, we're going to run. Hey, listen, um, thanks for stopping by. Jimmy Lee, founder and chief executive officer of the Wealth Consulting Group uh, out there in Vegas, $2.7 billion in assets under management and uh, talking about uh, his thoughts in, in terms of the environment. We're going to find opportunities. Yeah, his COVID thoughts are really interesting. Carol reminds me of what Michael Dowling, CEO at Northwell Health, told us earlier in the show. We are on the exit ramp of COVID. We're in a good place right now. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. And, and we are also increasingly learning at, you know, how to deal with this and move Move forward on it. All right, folks, just a few minutes left in the trading day. Equities just off their highs of the uh, session, barely higher on the S&P. Dow and the Nasdaq still down, but we definitely did see reaction when it comes to the equity markets coming off its lows following those FOMC minutes. All right, we're going to head over to our TV team for Beyond the Bell, our cross-platform coverage on radio, TV, and YouTube. We are counting you down to the close on this Wednesday. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic, Caroline High, Taylor Riggs counting you down to that closing bell here to help take us beyond the bell. It's our global simulcast partners, Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. We welcome in our audiences across Bloomberg Television, Radio, and YouTube. A lot of sharp moves right now, Carol, yeah. in this market in equities and bonds. And I just want to point out real quickly, a huge spike down right now in WTI crude now back down below 91 bucks a barrel was as high as 95 earlier in the day. Yeah, interesting reaction, especially coming off those FOMC minutes. Um, I love our Markets Live blog saying no fresh fodder when it comes to the Hawks when uh, they are thinking about the Federal Reserve. It feels like everybody just calmed down a little bit, and you saw that play out, certainly in the equity markets, and yields just coming in a hair. Yeah, it was interesting to see the narrative shift uh, around the day before we got those FOMC meetings, uh, meeting minutes over concerns about geopolitical tensions to then a 
essentially a sigh of relief that there wasn't anything more hawkish in those minutes, Caroline. Anastasia Amoroso, which is with us, though, from my capital, saying, look, it was more hawkish if you look at it. If really? you think that they're try going to listen to some of the words coming out, the in-between meeting discussion points that we hear from members of the FOMC. And she says, look, Bullard front and centre sort of saying we're going to get hawkish. And interesting, therefore, price moves on the back of that. But really, the market does seem more dovish on the day. We're up on the Russell. Interesting, all the notes that are coming in, uh, Caroline, from some of those Fed meeting minutes. I just read one that crosses the wire from BlackRock's Bob Miller, saying that the Fed can no longer afford to be data dependent and remain nimble because they are so far wow. behind the curve that they have to get moving and that they have no choice but to get moving absent an exogenous shock to the system. If those yeah. aren't some hawkish words, Romain, I don't know what is. All right, a mixed bag here uh, for the markets. We were deeper into the red on the day. We broke pretty high into the green here. It looks like we're going to end the day relatively flat here. About 300 stocks in the S&P are higher, but unfortunately, it's not really the big names that you need to sort of move us. The S&P 500 is going to close higher by about four points, about a tenth of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to close down 52 points, or about a tenth of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite also going to close down by about a tenth of a percent. The Russell 2000, a little bit more pep in its step here, up only about three points or so, just about a tenth of a percent or so on the day, Carol. I like that pep in your step. Uh, what's interesting, too, in terms of the uh, decliners and the winners, especially the winners, I felt like it changed to some extent in the S&P 500 after those FOMC minutes. As for names in the S&P, 305 names higher and Taylor 199 lower. And you really see that, Carol, when you take a look at some of the individual sectors, certainly a little bit more green than there is red. I think what really stands out to me is energy. Once again, the best performer on the day. Yesterday, I think crude fell more than two standard deviations below sort of its average and energy stocks were the underperformance. So you're really seeing that reversal today. You go down the board, there are a few losers. It's food and staples and it's software and services and technology. But those losses really are no comparison to some of the previous losses that we've seen earlier, Carol. All right, just quickly through some of the gainers because we are awaiting some big earnings after the close. Kraft Heinz up about 5.6%, so just off its highs. That was top in some of the major equity averages. Fourth quarter earnings topping estimates, price hikes helping the company offset those higher costs. Airbnb, we broke that down after the close yesterday, up about 3.7%, too, also beating on the top and bottom lines. The yeah. company's CEO saying the best in their history. Yeah. And then Huku. Oh, we got some earnings. Yeah, go let's, to uh, yeah I'm going to interrupt you there. You can Please. get to Huku later. Uh, we should point out Applied Materials uh, reporting earnings right now. The 1Q numbers here, the adjusted EPS coming in at $1.89. That's slightly above what the street was looking for at 